I'm Richard Walker, Executive Director of the Benjamin Rush Institute. We hope you enjoy today's edition of the Benjamin Rush Institute's virtual events series. This series would not be possible without the support of foundations that endorse the mission of the Benjamin Rush Institute, our student chapter members, and individuals like you. Through your support, we are able to continue informing and educating today's medical students about the benefits of patient-centered, doctor-focused methods for the practice of medicine, just like those discussed in this series. I encourage you to visit our website to learn more about the Benjamin Rush Institute and the medical students we serve. While you're there, please consider a donation to support our educational programs and events just like this one. You can donate by card, check, or by mail. Thanks for your support, and thanks for watching the Benjamin Rush Institute's virtual events series. My name is Rebecca Kiesling, and I am the Director of Programs for the Benjamin Rush Institute. Thank you all for joining us today in our April episode of the virtual event series. Um, it seems hard to believe that about a year ago now, um, we had our first, our first virtual event series um, event, and it was in conjunction with the closing down of medical schools across the country due to the COVID-19 pandemic. Um, we've had at least one a month, usually two uh, since then, and we're going to keep them going because it has been so popular. Uh, we are welcoming some of our medical school chapters here today. They are also streaming as events within their, um, within their medical schools. So welcome to you. Welcome to all of our attendees here on Zoom. Hopefully we'll get uh, Facebook going in just a few minutes. Um, what is interesting about what we've been doing over the past year uh, within these virtual events is we've been talking about a lot of things that really are at the core of why Benjamin Rush Institute exists. Um, we are here to further education on alternatives to what medical school uh, students are learning uh, and trying to support the doctor-patient relationship. Um, so much of what they're learning doesn't include alternatives to big business, big government, big pharma, and really over-regulation. Um, we have talked a lot in the past year about this over-regulation and how it's leading to the demise of that doctor-patient relationship. You know, we heard from our founder, Sally Pipes, about how this led to the formation of Benjamin Rush Institute. We heard from Dr. Keith Smith and David Ballot about price transparency and why that's needed. Um, Dr. Edward Timmons doc, uh, just last month talked about overregulation and licensing. And then the wonderful Carl, Carl Schusler talked about overregulation in the healthcare insurance industry. But how have these regulations, regulations really transformed the healthcare system into the behemoth it is today? And more importantly, really, what can we do about this? This is the topic we'll be discussing today with some very smart people from our friends at the Mercatus Center at the George Mason University. Dr. Kofi Amparbeng is a senior research fellow and data scientist at the Mercatus Center. He specializes in curating data and generating policy rev uh, relevant insights from that data. Prior to joining the Mercatus Center, he worked for Impact International, where he evaluated the efficacy of government programs. He received his PhD in economics from Clark University in Massachusetts and his BA in computer science and economics from the University of Ghana. Uh, Elise Amedro is a program manager for the Open Health Program at the Mercatus Center, where she manages the health policy portfolio. She's a public policy fellow with the Fund for American Studies and a member of the millennial cohort of AEI's leadership network. Previously, she worked as a market research associate for a startup company in the pharmaceutical industry. She is a graduate of the Fuqua School of Business at Duke University. Um, again, we are streaming um, within our medical school chapters, and I know you guys know how to get a hold of me uh, to ask questions. You can also ask questions here on Zoom. Um, within the chat, and I hope you do. Um, we are excited about this. This is a great opportunity to ask your questions about overregulation and about what is happening in that world. Um, 
We are so happy about our partnership and our friendship with the Mercatus Center. And um, this is a great opportunity to talk about that today. So I'm going to turn it over and um, thank you for joining us today. Hi everyone. Um, it's my pleasure to um, speak to you today about this topic. So thank you all so much for um, coming to this webinar. We're really excited to speak to you on this topic of regulated, um, how to care for patients in a third party payer system. So I'm not gonna go over those details again. Um, Rebecca just presented uh, the Mercatus Center. So we are a center at George Mason University focusing on bridging the gap between academic research and real world problems. And specifically what Kofi and I focus on is the issue of regulation and over-regulation in healthcare and what that means for policymakers and how they can remedy it. And also um, what that means for patients and, and physicians and uh, what we can do moving forward to make things better. So this is um, Kofi, he is um, the director of the Open Health Program at Mercatus. And like Rebecca said, he has a background, he's a PhD in economics and he's also a data scientist. And my background is in business and I oversee the Open Health Program at Mercatus. So today um, we're gonna split this agenda into two parts. So I'm gonna first like kind of talk about the background of the healthcare industry and how it's grown into um, what we have today. And so looking at healthcare as an island and then the price of all-inclusive care and what, what that means for our wallets and also for the provision of care for the doctor-patient relationship. And then I'll hand things over to Kofi who's gonna talk about a vision for the future of medicine and top priorities for reform. So I'm borrowing this term of healthcare as an island from somebody who has um, spoken to BRI, I, I believe before, and at least is someone who's, whom you might have heard of before. Uh, his name is David Goldhill. He wrote a book called Catastrophic Care. And he's, he takes this image of an island because we, we tend to think of healthcare as a bit of a different industry. Like um, health economics is its own field. Like healthcare is just... Um, viewed differently as if, as if markets did not apply on the, this island of healthcare, like economics works differently. And so to illustrate that, I would like to share a patient's story. So let's take a random patient, um, some, somebody who's in fairly good health, um, lives in, in the Washington DC area. Um, like, like her uh, insurance affords, she can have an, um, a discounted or have a low copay for an annual visit to the eye doctor for a vision test. And so this patient looks for uh, an eye doctor online, finds one that has good reviews, uh, books an appointment online, and then uh, even calls two days ahead of the, of the appointment to make sure that it's going to be a $10 copay and that they take her insurance. Uh, the person on the phone says, absolutely, we are all set. We look forward to seeing you at your appointment. And um, so the patient goes to the, to the appointment, everything goes um, according to plan. And um, on, on her way out, she checks out at the, at the front desk. And um, as it turns out, the, the total bill is $155. And this is a total surprise uh, for the patient who just was, was told that it was gonna be $10. And this is something that happens very frequently in healthcare. Like there, there seems to be this, this, um, uh, this way that in, in which the contracts are not really a respect or at least there are lots of, of hidden ways in which uh, it can be modified over time. So. There are common practices in healthcare that would not be acceptable in other areas of the economy. And this is really what um, David Goldhill gets at with his idea of the healthcare as an island, or the healthcare system as an island. So it has its own vocabulary in a sense. So in healthcare, we, we talk about costs and not prices. Um, that's very peculiar. So if we take something like a, like a, a laptop, if I'm going to purchase a laptop, I'm not asking um, the like, Best Buy um, salesperson, how much the screen is, and how much the what you know what is the cost of, of producing the keys or or the the OS. All I'm interested in is the price of, of the laptop. Or um, th that's true for for many other services and, and goods. But in healthcare, we we keep asking why is the cost of healthcare going up? What what goes into the cost of providing the services? And this is something that is very unique. Um, Insurance too uh, means something different in health in healthcare than it does for for example for a car insurance or for life insurance uh, because it pays for for everyday things everyday uh, interactions with the healthcare system are paid for uh, with insurance when in fact at least the, the latest number that we had and Kofi just sent them to me earlier over ninety percent of healthcare services um, go toward the uh, toward chronic care. 
So they are not emergencies. There are the vast majority of healthcare services are predictable. Um, there are services that are incurred regularly and that do not come as a surprise. And emergencies are a very small fraction of all healthcare needs. And yet, each American will spend at the very least $1 million over their lifetime on healthcare. And that's a very conservative estimate. Um, the truth is more like three to $4 million, depending on how much someone makes. So it's extremely expensive. And insurance covers, like I said, everyday things instead of, of uh, major, and major events are a small fraction of, those, of, those, um, of that spending. And so in the end, the real client in the healthcare industry currently is the payer um, so the insurance company, the public or private insurance company, and not the patient. And that has implications for the way care is provided, because as a physician, and many of you here are medical students, um, you, will, you will care for patients, but your real business relationship is with um, the payer. And that actually ends up influencing the way care is provided. So why is that the case? Well, back in the 60s, in, in 1963, Kenneth Arrow, who's a highly respected economist, he has a Nobel Prize, um, put out those principles in a paper that um, he published in a, in a journal. So he said that demand for healthcare services is irregular and unpredictable. Uh, that's an interesting claim because um, as we just saw, most of healthcare is actually chronic care. And so it's highly predictable, um, but the, he, he put out the fact that no, this, the demand was unpredictable. Then he said that physicians don't compete against each other and are not self-interested. And maybe we could talk about that in the Q&A, but my impression is that um, human beings compete generally and they have, each person chooses a profession or a professional activity per, to serve. And obviously doctors do, do serve and care for patients, but they, there is also a self-interest in it. Um, and there is a salary that also comes with the profession, of course. Treatment success is uncertain, he said, and there is information asymmetry. Um, that is not unique to healthcare, I would argue, right? Like um, when I hire a lawyer, I don't know if I'm going to win my case. And yet I can still uh, have a contract with, with that lawyer to know how much I'm going to pay them. And information asymmetry is also very common. Um, if I take a, the airline industry, I do not need to know uh, what kind of training goes into uh, piloting a plane. Uh, all I care about is getting from point A to point B. Uh, but again, Kenneth Arrow argued that this was a feature that was unique to the healthcare system. Uh, next, he said that licensing and high medical education tuition limit the supply of providers. Uh, that, is, that is certainly true, and I would agree with that. Uh, now the question is, is that necessary? Is that the way healthcare has to work? Or is it a feature of a system that we've kind of brought about through regulation? Um, maybe there's something more to dig into here. And then finally, he said that pricing varies based on circumstances. And I, you and I can come up with a lot of different um, settings in which um, prices and goods vary based on circumstances, based on location, based on the time. And so that, again, is not uh, peculiar to the healthcare industry. But Dr. Arrow did think that, that all of this made, uh, meant that um, markets do not work in healthcare and that we need government intervention. And sure enough, just two years later, the Centers for Medicaid and Medicare Services were created, um, and those have radically influenced the way healthcare is regulated, not only for public insurance like Medicaid and, Med Medicaid and Medicare, but for the broader system. And all of this has a price. Uh, it has a price to include um, lots of things into uh, the insurance system that we currently have. And I will argue that how we pay changes the care we give and get. So here is a graph that you're probably familiar with already. It shows that healthcare prices like college tuition keep climbing. And so uh, compared to inflation, hospital services and medical care services are climbing much faster. And um, this shows, this shows in a variety of ways. So back in 2008, um, then presidential candidate Barack Obama said that in an Obama administration, uh, we will lower premiums by up to $2,500 for a typical family per year. And I'll let you take a guess as to how that turned out. Uh, here's the, the cost curve. Um, since 2008, uh, like between 2008 and 2016, the end of, of Obama's second term, uh, we added over $10,000 to annual um, spending on healthcare for a typical American family. And today we're close to $30,000. 
And just by way of, for a point of reference, this is roughly half of the median household income in the US that goes toward healthcare alone. Um, this is one of my favorite graphs in, in healthcare policy <laughs> because it shows a very interesting breakdown of the cost, the utilization distribution. So at the very far right of this chart, you can see that the bottom 50% of healthcare spenders, and here we're really talking about the utilization of medical care, uh, is responsible for just 3% of healthcare spending. So half of the population, like the median spending, is roughly $650 uh, per, ca per, per, per capita for the, the median spending. And then uh, reversely, the top 5% spenders in healthcare are responsible for 50% of, of all healthcare spending. So there's a really big split here. And that shows that, it, it, again, combining this with the insight about chronic care spending, we know that most of these people, it's not like you're, you risk being in that category every year. It's like over your lifetime, you will incur um, expensive costs for healthcare. But insurance is really not the way to, to, to pay for a, a for care like this because it is actually highly predictable. Um, just going over the types of, of health insurance as of 2019, uh, roughly half of the country was covered by a private employer plan. Um, those leave very little choice, as you know, um, there are a certain number of plans that are offered by employers, but lots of them only offer one, one or two. Um, roughly a third of the country is covered by public insurance um, being Medicare and Medicaid. And then we have a private market, a private individual market that covers a little less than 6% of the population. And roughly half of that is uh, Obamacare exchange plans. And then we have 9% that is uninsured, um, as, as you know. So let's talk a little bit about what that means. So private insurance is primarily employer-based insurance. The high prices that we see in, um, in employer-based insurance means that the take-home pay growth is very much hampered by, by the, the growth of, of those costs because even as you know, wages might grow, but much of that growth is going towards a growing health premiums. And there are other options and Kofi will talk about some of them later, but they don't have mass appeal for, for a variety of reasons. And I'm happy to go, about, uh, go into those in the Q&A if that's of interest. Um, in the individual market, a limited demand limits the supply. So there are very few people in the individual market. And so there's little, um, there's little competition there. Uh, and some plans are under attack. And I'm thinking here specifically about short, uh, short duration uh, plans that um, a, a large um, section of the political spectrum does not, um, does not think is, is valuable, even though they actually turn out to, pro to provide very good coverage. And then we have the marketplace plans. Uh, I thought that was an interesting fact. 90% of enrollees are in non-HSC plans. So they're paying with post-tax uh, post, um, dollars uh, for their healthcare instead of, of pre-tax with HSAs. And the average deductible in an ACA plan from the Affordable Care Act is $5,300. Um, the vast majority of Americans do not have that kind of money uh, sitting around in a bank account to spend on healthcare annually. Um, so this is a, a like kind of the opposite of, of affordable, if you ask me. Uh, when we when it comes to public insurance, uh, the Medicare um, system is extremely generous, and it dictates prices across the system. So that is contributing to the, the price growth that we have. There is increased competition in Medicare Advantage that is helping a little bit, but it's still a, a huge program, and people get out of it roughly three times as much as they put in, and. So that means that the program is quickly going bankrupt and actually it's supposed to go bankrupt around year 2026. So most of us will unfortunately not um, see the benefits of Medicare and we don't really know what's coming next. So uh, we shall see. Uh, when it comes to Medicaid, the average spending per capita is lower than for other insurance types. Um, so that has implications. Uh, it means that doctors are paid less uh, for providing care to Medicaid beneficiaries and as the Medicaid expansion continues, um, there isn't a similar number of doctors that are joining Medicaid and providing care. So there, it, there are like backlogs and, and even lower access for people who technically have insurance but are not able to access the services they need. 
And finally, I wanted to note something about the American Rescue Plan Act, which um, is the $1.9 trillion COVID-19 relief package that was passed a couple of months ago. Uh, it made significant changes to Obamacare. So one of them is that federal reimbursement for Medicaid expenditures at the state level is now going to be reimbursed at 95% instead of 90%. Um, and that's really putting pressure on states to continue the Medicaid expansion that, um, that other states have, have uh, enacted. Um, people with income up to 400% of the federal poverty line um, are eligible now for marketplace subsidies. And again, that's going for those marketplace um, ACA plans. And then COBRA, which is the insurance that you can get if you get fired or if you lose your job, um, this is going to be paid for in full by the federal government through September 2021. And so this is, again, far more federal money going towards the insurance of individuals. And um, it's taking, again, away uh, from the individual uh, decisions that, that patients can make for their care. And I think it's going to have uh, significant uh, implications for the provision of care and, and for doctors wanting what's best for their patients and for their patients to be able to take control over their own healthcare dollars. And so with this background, I'll hand it over to Kofi, who will talk more about the future of medicine and, um, and opportunities for reform. Future of medicine. Thanks, Elise, for covering, uh, giving a very good um, background introduction to the state of healthcare um, right now. And I'm going to talk briefly about what are some of the opportunities for reform, but I'm going to start with what um, the Make Creative Center does, or at least what we try to focus on in terms of the healthcare sphere. And we'll be looking at some of the barriers to care um, as well, and some of the a vision that we think um, uh, will serve um, healthcare well in the future. So at the Make Edu Center, our goal really, or the Open Health Project, is to remove artificial barriers to healthcare. Um, and as I will talk about later, some of these artificial barriers are erected by the government, so federal government through Medicare, Medicaid, the ACA, and states through um, licensure, facilities regulation, and a host of others. And it is our hope that as we remove a lot of these barriers, healthcare becomes more affordable and more accessible. In fact, that's really the most important thing, especially now that we seem to always equate coverage with accessible healthcare, which is not exactly the same. And even more important that doctors are able to spend more time or medical providers in general with their patients. And there are opportunities for that as we, as, as the third party payer system gradually recedes, we should actually be able to see physicians spending more time with their patients. So just a quick overview of some of the artificial barriers. One of the most egregious is facility restrictions or facility con laws. Basically, these are what we call certificate of need laws. The idea, I don't know how many are familiar, but I'm just going to go over for um, completeness, is for a lot of states, actually 35 of them right now, before you expand the hospital, acquire major um, equipment, build a new hospital, you actually need to justify the economic need for such a facility um, within the jurisdiction. And it is a very tedious process. It's very expensive for a lot of people, it's um, a lot of places. And so it has led to significant consequences down the line. Another area is practice restrictions. And it probably doesn't apply to physicians as much, but it is part of the totality of restrictions that we face. And it has to do with whether people who are trained are actually able to perform to their full ability rather than just politically defined, um, discrete set of services that they can provide. These are all things that sort of artificial barriers that we erect. And a lot of these apply to telehealth, which thankfully has seen a lot of rollback of some of these restrictions. And as most of you would be aware, or at least if you're not now going forward, how paperwork requirements, particularly electronic health report, um, requirements, reporting quality data to ARC and to QA and all those places actually seem to also impact um, care. And so with all these in mind, what do we think the future looks like? And for us, or at least for, from our perspective, we think that really at a minimum, we can summarize the future of healthcare to be like this, that you pick an analogy from something we're all familiar with is you should pay for oil change out of pocket 
because that's normally something that is mostly likely going to happen. And you can insure against more um, unlikely events, but uh, when they happen, they're actually costly. So you can use the example of the engine, right? So you insure against um, engine failure. And this has always been the example that we give. So essentially, where we have a lot of we, because through the third-party payer system, insurance seems to cover a lot of things that we could actually pay out of pocket. And by that process, we keep giving more and more power to the payers, the insurance companies, or even the Medicare Medicaid programs, who then are able to impose a lot of regulations through the payment mechanism. And so with the advent of, or at least with the increase in adoption of telehealth and virtual health platform in general, what we see, or at least what we hope to see, and we think is actually going to happen, is this what we call the bifurcation of healthcare. What do I mean by that? Telehealth services are available, it's being used extensively. What that means is there's a lot of low intensity, and this is a, quite a term that is not formally defined, but I think of it as the kinds of services that could actually be offered um, remotely. So one of the, as you would see later in a few of the slides, Behavioral health is one of the key areas that is actually being used um, in terms of telehealth and consultation. There's a lot of services that could actually be provided via telehealth. And the beauty of that is telehealth prices are fixed or at least are known ahead of time. And so we can actually offer those services to people that people can then actually pay out of pocket. And doctors are never going to go away. But there's a lot more intensive services that require personal care um, that would actually still need to be provided by um, insurance. And those have a lot of risk and uncertainty that could then be provided through insurance. Okay, So that's how we think healthcare would look like in the future. And that's what we mean by commoditizing healthcare. Because the way health telehealth has been working is technology companies have built platforms that practices are able to essentially acquire and used to provide telehealth services. So it's not uncommon to have the medical records or the platform that the company would use to um, make the connection, collect the data, do whatever monitoring it is there. Okay. And so that essentially becomes a commodity. Now, that said, let's take a closer look at something like um, telemedicine. Prior to COVID, the utilization of telehealth was practically non-existent. And a lot of it has to do with restrictions from Medicare in particular, even though there were other restrictions from states. And before you could actually provide telehealth service that you could then be reimbursed for, the, parent, the patient had to be in a rural area. And not just that, the patient actually had to go to a particular facility in order to connect to a physician who is located in uh, somewhere else. And even that some of them actually required prior relationship that should have existed for at least three years. And then obviously there was also some restrictions in terms of what technologies could be considered telehealth. Thankfully, with the loosening of restrictions as a result of COVID, a lot of these requirements were waived. But these are some of the barriers that, because Medicare was such a big player, was the regulator, physicians depended on Medicare for reimbursement, they actually had to live by these regulations, okay? so taking away some of the things, the tools that are available that we could essentially use to provide care to patients. And to just keep talking about the telehealth team, this is one of the slides I talked about earlier. This is factoring in the COVID period um, between, say, March 2020 all the way till the end of 2021. I'm sorry, 2020, December. This data is from the Commonwealth Fund. At least 55% um, of visits for behavioral health were actually by telehealth. And this is coming from a very small number previously. I mean, for a lot of these are actually practically non-existent. Similarly with endocrinology, obviously a few other services are not um, amenable to telehealth and you can see them from this slide. But it is interesting that quite a lot of services could actually be moved to the virtual health platform, which is gonna be a combination of remote connection using software, using artificial intelligence to then um, connect the patients to their providers. 
And so this is picking up the point that Elise was making earlier regarding um, Kenneth Aru's point about the unique features of the healthcare market. The good thing is that then once we have some of these low intensity services that I talked about, we can actually have predicted prices, right? So for a number of telehealth platforms like Teladoc, um, MD Live, or Able2, these are services that actually have fixed prices. So they know that there's going to be this consultation. You can actually pay this amount for care. And we can also have some certainty in demand um, as to how much or how many people are going to require such services. Um, they are definitely lower cost. Uh, in fact, they actually use for things like um, chronic care management. Um, in addition to that, and that's one of the key things, non-physician providers can actually provide care together with the help of technology. And so we can still have physician supervision depending on the state you live in, but still have um, and expanded access to care um, with a lot more people. And finally, one of the key things about that is that then patients can actually make direct payments to physicians, right? Reducing the dependency on third party providers. And this is a quote from um, a physician who worked with uh, CMS's um, deployment as a pilot program to use telehealth for chronic care management. And so there was a question that was asked, how do you feel um, the benefits of telehealth compared to in-person? And basically, this is directly from someone who took part. They are less costly, they are less intrusive, and they are easier to accomplish. And so what we see is going forward, telehealth or virtual health, which is a combination of all these services, is going to be an instrumental part in chronic care, in primary care, in behavioral care. And these are things that can then be paid for out of pocket. Now, the other side of this bifurcation is going to be the high intensity services where there could be some unpredictable prices, right? I mean, if someone comes in, it could be that you need to perform a battery of tests in order to determine what um, the ailment really is and the treatment, and it could take on longer. So, uh, we cannot predict demand as much, and it could be more costly, but physicians could still be aided by a care. And in such a system, obviously then, the insurance system would make a lot of sense to do that. So this is what we think healthcare will look like once we're able to remove all the regulatory barriers to the adoption of, um, to I mean, to innovation in healthcare it has to do with whether it has to do with practice um, providers or certificate of need laws or um, or telehealth adoption. Okay. Unfortunately, we just as with legislators everywhere, there's always something they're looking for to. Um, to do. Um, so right now, if a lot of states have been passing laws to enshrine changes that were made to tele telehealth into law, and there are a number of mandates coming in. So for example, they would mandate that insurance company or um, an HMO or a state provider provides telehealth coverage. In addition to that, they mandate a lot of them mandate payment parity. What that basically says is, for a particular service known by a billing code, regardless of the location, you should charge the same amount. We think this is regressive because it is totally ignoring the cost of production. And this is essentially introducing the same rigidities that exist in the system to something that is new and evolving. And so over the next few months, our work, uh, we're actually gonna be focusing and highlighting some of these barriers that are actually going to um, sort of impact the adoption or at least progress towards um, this vision of healthcare that we've talked about. There's something else going on that has nothing to do with regulation, but it's something to keep an eye on, um, which is a lot of fiscal integration. So having these platforms on there that I just talked about, there's MD Live, there's Able2, which is uh, for mental health. The insurance companies are then actually acquiring a lot of these when I think it's about the third or four, four of them, there are a few others as well, that are being acquired, right? Um, it could be that they would use them to streamline operations or they could change them down the line so that all of these benefits that are accruing as a result of the adoption of telehealth um, could actually go away. So we're going to keep an eye on that and see, make sure that these gains are not reversed in that. Um, yeah. So with all that said, with uh, sort of a vision articulated in the future, what are some of these changes that we need to make um, going forward to um, Make ensure that physicians are able to spend more time and provide better care to their patients. At the federal level, payment reforms are important. And 
Currently, there are HSAs, the health savings accounts, and the HRA, um, the newly expanded health retirement account that allow employers to basically provide funds for, I'm talking of HRAs, to that employees can then use to pay for healthcare. The fund stays with the employer, um, even though it could accrue year after year. So when spent funds could accrue year to year, that stays for the employer. And they are limited in terms of what could be used. HSA, for example, cannot be used for direct care payment. Um, and so these are some of the advocacies we can make to make sure some of these laws are changed so that HSA could actually be used to make um, direct care payments. Coming down to the states, um, full practice authority is important, um, telehealth expansion, and then removing corn laws. And starting with practice authority, it's I know it's a sticky point, but they don't provide inferior care. Nurse practitioners are particularly in advanced practice nurses in particular do not exactly provide inferior care. But from state to state, we do see laws that essentially constrain what they can do. And here, in fact, if you go across all states, in fact, California, in a few places that have tried to at least expand the authority of nurses, most of the time it's been the medical association that has actually been standing in the way of getting more people to practice. But study after study has basically shown that there's actually no harm done. Um, sometimes it's actually cheaper and the care is at same, um, and there's no like, deterioration in care. And in particular, it's actually, they're actually useful for um, underserved areas, areas that do not have a physician available, or at least um, within necessary pro um, proximity, that having nurse practitioners and other care providers available is actually very important. Um, one other thing that I sort of found very interesting is, is even just the way pharmacists are treated over time. Pharmacists are limited in terms of even administering vaccines, and they've had to periodically go back to the legislature to get authority to vaccinate. While study after study has shown that they're actually not harmful, they do um, a decent job. So these are important areas for reform. States have been leading that. Um, I do know that the AMA has not exactly been on board with practice authority, but they're actually very good compliments. In fact, a lot of research and projections by BLS shows that there's actually, while the number of physicians is not growing as much, the number of nurse, um, nurse practitioners, um, physician assistants keeps growing. And so together with technology, there's a lot of service that could actually be brought down to um, these people to administer care. And as I mentioned, payment parity laws is one of the biggest problems in healthcare. And a lot of the times the legisl legislature again tends to narrowly define what um, counts as telehealth. Again, as states have moved to expand telehealth, a lot of these restrictions are being removed, but quite a few of them still remain. Now I'm turning my attention to certificate of need laws. Um, currently there are 35 states with different types of certificate of need laws as um, we explained. And as you can see, like a pattern emerges. A lot of the big states, California, Texas, um, uh, Pennsylvania, tend to have a lot of these con laws in place with a lot of restrictions. And it's been shown, study after study, Mercedes has done um, a wonderful job documenting the impact of certificate of need laws. And together with other research, essentially each certificate of need law shows that it actually it's actually been documented to lead to an increase in wait times. Um, hospital costs are about 15% higher in states with corn laws. And even more important, um, in rural areas, rural areas in states with corn laws tend to actually have about 30% fewer hospitals. So they don't really serve anybody. And one of the most harrowing stories I had was uh, with a county in West Virginia that was looking to build a hospital, Wyoming County. And they could not satisfy any of the corn laws. And so in order to go to the nearest hospital, which was like about an hour away in terms of emergency, they had to go through bumpy roads. This is rural West Virginia. So you can imagine how things are. And these are people who are actually being affected by regulations that only do nothing but benefit incumbents. Going forward, as we aim to see that patients sort of get reconnected with their providers, I, I, and I know um, the Rush, Benjamin Russian Institute is pretty big on this, but direct care, direct primary care is a very radical approach to taking back control. 
In fact, study after study, there's a recent study by the Society of Actuaries that actually show that direct care um, physicians spend about 50, 40 minutes more time, um, 40 minutes on the average with their patients compared to just 16% with regular physicians. And that's a lot of time, considering the fact that lots of studies, again, have shown that often physicians spend about half that I, what I've seen the most conservative estimates I've seen is that just about half of time is spent on electronic medical records, paperwork, um, as opposed to sort of seeing patients. There being some change, there's a movement across states to um, exclude um, DPC from insurance regulations. And so that's a good thing. Um, the pace needs to pick up um, over the some over this legislative season. Researchers at Medicaid has testified and um, sort of in various legislature about the need to allow more DPC or at least take more exclude DPC from um, insurance regulations so that more people can actually have direct connections to their physicians and go on. The DPC is still expanding, it's still pretty nascent. Um, there are still restrictions in states and places here and there that um, prevent their adoption. And then finally, they, as I mentioned earlier, the adoption of um, HSA accounts, um, there are still restrictions at the federal level that limit what could be used for HSA, particularly not being used for direct care. These are all areas for reform that we will be making our voices heard. Finally, I'm just gonna end up um, talking about what we do at Make Edit Center in terms of helping highlight some of these issues. At the Open Health Project, we've created a tool that we call the Healthcare Rec Data. And it is built on machine learning and algorithms, artificial intelligence, and some basic text analysis. And what we've done is that we look at every state and even the federal level, try to identify healthcare regulations just based on the code. So depending on what field you are, you might see healthcare regulations here and there. But having that unified platform where we're able to identify all healthcare regulations we think is relevant. And we don't stop there. Once we identify these um, regulations, we actually quantify them. So we've developed a metric where we call healthcare restrictions or at least um, regulatory restrictions. So we look at how a state, the number of restrictions in a particular state, and we define a restriction as the identification of like a term in the code that sort of places a constraint either on the provider or the individual, or just any restriction at all. And then not just that, we're actually able to classify these restrictions so we can tell which industry these um, restrictions apply. So can we tell whether it affects hospitals? Does it affect what occupation? Does it affect um, physicians? Does it apply, apply to um, physician assistants? In addition to that, as I showed you in one of the earlier slides, we've created the, what we call the certificate of need laws database which again allows us to identify the and quantify um, certificate of needs across states. And so we look into every state's regulatory um, code and at least as being sort of instrumental in that together with other researchers and identify the various types of restrictions. These tools are useful for research and also for red tape reduction. And we're happy to say that, in fact, um, Reg Data, which is the primary platform on which health Reg Data is built on, has been instrumental in leading regulatory red tape reforms in places such as Idaho, um, Oklahoma, even Mississippi. They've sort of used that information that we provide to look at the volume of regulations and then be able to start remove them. But even more important, we think that as researchers, we're actually able to use these data to examine the impact of some of these regulations on health services and health outcomes as well. And so this is a trove of data that are available um, on our website that researchers can use and use to see if they can answer various research questions. Just to give you a quick overview of some of the things we do with the data, this is using reg data, um, using the restrictions that I mentioned, counting the occurrence of restrictive terms to look at, okay, for the various occupations, um, the healthcare occupations across all the states, how many restrictions are there based on our count, right? And so for the scholar, you basically see these are what we call the health diagnosis and treating practitioners. So Florida, um, Kentucky tend to have a lot of these regulations that apply to healthcare practitioners. Um, 
opticians and dispensing, there's a lot more in Florida than we could see in any of the other regions um, classified by the BEA as a Southeast region. But so this is just an example, because here we're looking at just the Southeast region of how we can use the data that we create to quantify regulatory restrictions across for research and for red tape reduction and discussion. Thank you for your time. Um, you can always contact me or at least um, on any of these links and I'll be happy to take your questions. Thank you both of you so much. Um, I am getting blown up with questions right now, which I completely expected. Um, for everyone here uh, and that's joining us from our chapters, um, I am going to send out the links to the Open Health Care Project or Open Health Project, um, I will make sure that you have those links because they're really important. I'm also gonna send the link to, we had uh, Matthew Mitchell uh, from Mercatus Center back August of last year talking about uh, certificate of need laws. Um, it was really informative to me. Um, I thought I knew something, didn't really know much. Um, and it's a, it's a lot more information um, that we can go into, we, you can go in depth to if you uh, if you haven't seen it already. Um, a lot of questions, and I'm going to try to group them into um, in into buckets here. Um, Elise, I want to get in back into some of the things that you mentioned. Um, the biggest questions I had, uh, there were really two. Um, about big buckets. Uh, the first was about telehealth and technology. Um, we have spoken about, I mean, you know, you mentioned that we're big on uh, DPC, direct primary care. Um, I like direct care really. And I was thrilled that you talked about different specialties. Uh, I hadn't seen that chart before. I thought that was really interesting that the in the past year or year and a half, how sp different specialties have been using uh, telehealth. Um, there's a couple of different things that I'd like to, that I want to talk about with um, in terms of telehealth. First of all, when it comes to artificial intelligence and technology, where do you see and what have you seen um, growth growth wise in terms of AI? We have a chapter in particular that is really interested in the development of AI because medical schools have to catch up. Um, they have to catch up in this. Um, and it's going to be interesting in terms of what you see versus how medical schools catch up. So I think I'll take this one. I think I had that slide up in my session. Um, so that's, I mean, that's an interesting question. It's actually something that it's exploding. In fact, um, there, there's a whole venture capital I'm aware of that is just dedicated to funding startups in medical technology. And a lot of these startups are actually what are driving the adoption and the evolution of virtual health and medical care. So what virtual health does recently, I mean, these days, is that now we are miniaturizing lots of devices, right? So EKGs, now you actually have a device that you can use to take blood pressure um, that goes to your provider. That these are the this is the revolution that is happening. So instead of going to the facility to have your blood pressure taken, a lot of these can be done home and actually be communicated to your provider through a lot of these platforms. And so this is where the growth is happening. This is where the innovation is happening. The miniaturizing of devices using artificial intelligence to make decisions. At least not even not to fully make decisions, but at least aid. Um, the provider in making decisions, make things easier for them. So from my perch, this is where I see the, a lot of the growth is happening. And that is why these insurance companies are actually stepping in to buy a lot of these startups and try to acquire them because that is what the growth is going to be. I'm, in a way, I'm kind of, I'm still trying to see where, whether I'm going to be worried about it or I should be excited about the, um, the vertical integration, but it's something to keep an eye on. It might end up swallowing all this progress we are seeing and just co-opting it into the existing system, which I'll be very disappointed if it happens. But um, as a free market, I'm not inclined to step in and do anything, but I do hope that um, the progress continues. I think, you know, one of the biggest things that we all see, obviously, and you mentioned, and both of you mentioned this, we saw a lot of these um, regulations that where hindrances um, go away or get squashed a little bit um, 
due to COVID, due to the pandemic. And um, I really thought it was interesting, um, as did many people, when you talked about what could be a hindrance with in the future. Um, the payment parity laws, that's not something I, I know a lot about. And I think that was, it raised a lot of red flags. Um, what, what is the, can you, can you go into that a little bit more? Um, I think, especially with DPC doctors, DPC, uh, they've been doing telehealth a lot longer than a lot of people. Um, you know, we, we had people talking before, um, some of our doctors before in previous episodes of our virtual event series, talking about the fact that, you know, at the beginning of the pandemic, they had colleagues, not DPC doctors talking to them, how do we do this? So how is it going to, I mean, clearly if you're not being, if you're not going through insurance, uh, you don't have to worry about that, but what is that going to look like? Um, how, what are you seeing right now? So I think you mentioned two things in there, right? The payment parity um, and sort of the future utilization of um, telehealth in DPC. Payment parity is interesting. It's, it's a sort of thing that if you look at it, look at the incentives in the system, right? You have to sort of take a step back. Remember, we are fighting against this third party payer system. So everybody has an interest in making sure things happen. One of the biggest barriers to adoption of telehealth had always been the fact that telehealth was cheaper, okay? There have been studies that show you that it's about a third the cost of an acute care in-person visit. So if I am an, if I am a provider or something, which one would I go for? If I'm going to do telehealth and I'm going to make a third of what I would as opposed to getting the full amount, right? So there was some reluctance to adoption, obviously, apart from the fact that it was also new. So from the point of view of insurance providers or hospitals, this payment parity was important for adoption. Where I have a problem is that you're artificially setting a price. We are refusing to let the cost of care determine the price. And unfortunately that is true for almost all of healthcare. We just go by whatever, we, I mean, it's one of the biggest mysteries that we still don't know how people exactly price care. And but at least with telehealth, people could devise that. Listen, I know that it's going to take 15% of, I mean, 15 minutes of my time. If I were to price my hourly wage by X, Y, Z, I could come up with something. But we've sort of got rid of, gotten rid of all that and now I'm mandating parity. In some places, so I recently finished reviewing Maryland's um, telehealth new law. And what they do is that they established payment parity for just three years up until 2023. And it could probably mean that they would probably go back and review um, I reviewed Montana's law. Montana did not mandate payment parity, which was good. Arizona mandated payment parity. So you see where I'm driving at. You're going to have this patched landscape of laws and stuff that is going to get crazy to navigate. Again, a lot of these laws are creating huge conflicts for someone like me who really believes in federalism and the states being able to try new things. And yet you come up with these. Unfortunately, we don't have state-based companies anymore. A lot of companies spread across. And so then you'd have to hire a regulatory compliance person to help you navigate. And these all keep adding to the cost that we eventually bear and all the things that we face. So payment priority laws are a problem. Um, I don't have a solution. I would really, my recommendation is just leave them alone. Let the field evolve. The, the low cost of telehealth is one of the advantages. So let it happen. With regards to the utilization of telehealth in direct care, I think that's going to be tricky, right? One of the advantages we're talking about direct primary care is having that longer um, contact with your patients. So I showed you the study by the Society of Actuaries that showed that on the average, DPC patients sort of about 40 minutes uh, with their patients compared to just 16 earlier. But if you're going to physically see your patients, you're probably not going to need um, that as much. But I, I mean, I kind of prognosticate on that, but I can see a scenario where you will still need a lot of this virtual health platform to communicate to, for example, when it comes to things like patient monitoring, if I have a chronic care and I'm working with my um, physician, is there a way to keep communicating so that I can report my blood pressure, my sugar levels, but there are all devices to help you manage all these things. Right. And, you know, it, on your chart, it was surgery. There were, that, it was not the lowest one. So I'm assuming that was the back and forth. Um, so it's something to watch. And hopefully, you know, there's also the group somewhere, the advocacy group that might be hopefully doing something about that. Um, Elise, we, we, we spoke to 
a person that he's, and he hates being called this. He's an insurance broker. Um, a couple of two months ago that he deals with outside of the Cigna and the Blue Cross Blue Shield and for larger companies. Um, so I was interested by your comment um, that other options don't have mass appeal. Um, can you go into that a bit? Yeah, I'd really like to. I think there are varied reasons why um, it's harder. I do think that path dependency is a big one. Like for a lot of large companies, it's just what they've always done. Um, to contract with the same health insurance company. Uh, even it gets to the point where health insurance companies, like the, the brokers, I mean, let's take a big one to like, you know, like a, the broker of a Cigna or a Blue Cross Blue Shield has an established kind of business contract with, um, with a company, um, with a large company. And it's just the easiest thing is just to stick with that contract, to stick with the provider. It's, it's also difficult to battle, to, to fight that kind of change internally. Uh, lots of employees don't realize that their health insurance is a really bad deal for them, or the the that's just all they know, right? That's just all as as employees, all we know is using our health insurance to purchase care. It's scary to go out and think that there are other ways to pay for care. Um, no one wants to be the first person to do that. No one wants to be the first company to do that. So there's also a first mover disadvantage in the sense of the there is no willingness among the employees, and there's no. Um, real incentive uh, other than, than the money, which I think ultimately will actually be the reason why um, those options will become more mainstream. Like we, if you look at the health uh, reimbursement accounts or arrangements that Kofi mentioned, those actually make a lot of sense for younger companies with younger employees that don't have very high um, healthcare costs. And so suddenly uh, using that type of, of um, more individualized insurance arrangements makes a lot of sense for employees that want to keep more of their pay uh, in terms of cash and not in terms of, you know, a, a health benefits that benefit that they will not use. So I think we'll start seeing some change at the younger, more startup-y kind of, um, you know, scene of, of, um, of things. But for the large companies, I think it's going to be a long time until um, the large insurance companies just become completely unaffordable for those larger companies. They're also so incredibly powerful with huge bankrolls. So, you know, what we spoke about before a couple months ago um, was it, it, there's a lobby there. And we know that anything that has that huge lobby, whether it is insurance or hotel and lobby, you know, anything like that, it's the hardest to fight against. So when a new type of insurance is going against one of the big, you know, the Cigna, the United, the Blue Cross, um, they have a lot of money and it's hard to fight against that. So um, it, it's, it'll be interesting once that demand comes and people start, it starts appealing to people's bank accounts or whatever that appeal is and people understand it more, um, you know, education's everything. Um, so this is one, it, this is something that as at BRI, we, I'm not going to say struggle with, it is one that is always a big topic. And it's one that I want to do a debate, a virtual debate on. Um, because I think while we, um, we are a free market organization, you know, we, we talk about the free market and what that means. Um, and how that does is a, you know, it, it is why we do, we show alternatives that promote the doctor patient relationship. Um, we also are, you know, we are for, for, for physicians and helping physicians in their quality of life. Um, so scope of practice. Um, it's a, I think that's where so many of my questions from the students come from because you spoke of the AMA and AMA and I are not, we're not always on the same page and that's okay. Um, but we did have somebody, a physician, her name's Dr. Rebecca Barnard. Um, she was on um, maybe six, seven months ago, and she spoke about uh, scope of practice and how it should be physician led. Um, but knowing that the market is, it's market driven. And the market says that physician, uh, PAs and nurse practitioners, and you mentioned um, pharmacists, could have a bigger scope, a bigger role depending on what the market is driven. So I'm, I'd love to go into that more, um, knowing that I might come back to you all and say, can you be part of my debate? Because I think it is such an important thing to talk about. Um, 
I think getting some clarity on that is, I don't know if there's going to be clarity, um, getting some more talk about that is really important for especially our medical students to understand. Um, okay. Sure, I can I can talk about that briefly. I, I know I I knew it was always going to be a tough topic to talk about um, with this crowd, but um, it's important. We let's look at the evidence, right? The typical scope of practice. Let and I don't know how much time we have. How did this all these restrictions evolve? It started out by the AMA being the first in the game, so they got a lot of state um, legislatures to allow doctors to going to be the primary caregivers, right? So anything that has to do with healthcare was almost exclusively. Um, reserved for doctors. Obviously, they had long training, come to, I mean, dating back to the Flexional Report, um, sort of a streamline the medical education process, so you can understand why. The problem is, as time has, has gone on, a lot of these other fields are getting very good education. They're getting trained in a lot of things that they can actually do. And the good thing is that they're also cheaper. And even add to the fact is that technology is evolving at such, sp- at such pace that they could actually do a lot of the work either aided by technology or by the training that they've received in um, the educational institutions. So there's really a lot that um, is sort of possible right now, right? Because they are better trained and there is technology to help them. What we do have in a lot of states is, and I think if I'm correct, about 24 states have full practice authority to um, advance practice nurses. Some have restricted and a few of them, I think about 12, I could be wrong, I haven't. The numbers keep changing. About 12 or so, mostly the big ones, do not have practice authority. And the point is that I've looked at study after study. I am yet to come across a study that has reported a significant um, negative outcome when more authority is delegated to advanced practice nurses. And I could be wrong um, because obviously there's so, the literature is so large, but one of the biggest experiments was the VA, right? So VA actually grants um, full practice authority to its nurses. In fact, they just finalized the rule to do that. And there've been several reports that show that either costs, costs go down, um, care is just as good, all right? And there's really no adverse finding. I haven't seen one that says there's adverse finding. So we just have to look at the data and let the data tell us. Okay, we've had experiments that say, let the nurse try something. I mean, like, do we honestly think that we want doctors to be doing all these? And I don't think doctors want to be doing all the things that nurses do. They will still want to be able to retain some authority to supervise. And I can understand that. The good thing is that as technology keeps evolving, we can actually have better tools for coordination and team-based care in a way that is not too limiting. Because this approach where we have very this discrete authority for specific operations and procedures, think about it. As medical procedures evolve, do we really want to keep going back to the legislature every time for permission to learn and do one thing or the other? You know, when we are still training these people to keep doing different things. So we should be open about it and have this conversation that people are being trained and trained very well. And so we should be able to delegate some of them so that as I explained in my vision of how healthcare will evolve, doctors will now spend a lot more time on the very um, difficult cases, the more intensive cases, especially since we've also restricted how many doctors we are creating, right? Yet we are creating a lot more of these advanced practice nurses. In fact, they are projected to grow by 94% over the next 10 years. same thing for physician assistants. They are growing at a very fast rate and they're being educated very well. So that's really the, the point about the practice next and sort of the scope of practice. It's, they are very artificial barriers. I mean, the pharmacy one was really ridiculous when I saw it. It's like the type of vaccine you can give, not just that, who you can vaccinate. It limits whether you can vaccinate under teenagers. I mean, whether you can vaccinate teenagers or adults. I mean, ask yourself. I know doctors have great education, but really, Does the law need to specify the age for which a pharmacist can actually administer a pneumococcal vaccination? I mean, like, is that really what we want to do? So that's what we do. That's what we've clogged our laws with, with some of these very discreet prohibitions and stuff like that. And I don't think it's helpful. There's a lot. (laughs) There's, we have, I I knew this was going to happen too. I knew that there were going to be a lot of questions and there there was going to be a lot of, um, we could go back and forth for a long time. Um, One of my chapters has to sign off soon. Um, I'm going to put in our, in our email um, out to everyone, your contact information. Um, And again, we, I'm going to put links to the Mercatus Center. If you got, if people listening to this right now are not familiar with the Mercatus Center at the George Mason University, which is like 
three minutes down the, um, the street from where I live, um, you should be. Uh, the, the information that they provide, the research that they do is it's essential to where we're headed, um, not just in healthcare, but across the board. They do really, really good work. Um, and they're strategic partners with a lot of other groups that I have found great partners for us um, with just throughout for so many years. And so I'm very thankful to the work that you guys do and how you're helping further everything we do across um, so much of um, healthcare, but beyond that as well. Um, if you, I will also put a link to our YouTube because I've mentioned kind of some other people that we've spoken to. Um, and if you do have any other questions that we didn't get to today, which I, I'm, I apologize to that, for that, please get in touch um, using the email addresses that I, I provide in our follow-up email. Um, I want to thank you both for your time today. It was, it's something that I'm going to go back to um, when, the, when, we, when I look at the recording. Um, there was a lot of information there, a lot of really good information. Um, and we're just gonna keep working. I'm gonna follow a lot of this stuff now that I wasn't familiar with. Um, next month we have Daniel Sem, who is going to be doing something that we have been trying, I've been trying to get for a while. We're gonna be talking kind of free market healthcare 101. Um, for a lot of our students, it's super important because how do you talk about this? What are the talking points? Um, we need to be doing more of this. And I'm very excited to talk to Dr. Sem because he's really good at this. Um, and he's going to be bringing up some pharmaceutical stuff as well, because that's one of his specialties. So um, join us for that. Um, I'll put a link for the registration in the follow-up email. And it, as always, if you have any questions, please get in touch with me. And um, thank you both very much. I appreciate your time. Thanks for having us. We appreciate it. Yeah, thank you so much. I hope you enjoyed today's edition of the Benjamin Rush Institute's virtual events series. To learn more about our educational programs and events just like the virtual events series, I encourage you to visit our website. While you're there, you can subscribe to the Benjamin Rush Institute's YouTube channel and link not only to all episodes in this series, but also to all of our past meetings, events, and conferences. And please consider supporting our work on behalf of the medical students we serve by donating to our efforts. Your support is vital if we are to continue to provide important educational programs and events just like this one. We appreciate your support and please watch for your invitation to the next edition of the Benjamin Rush Institute's Virtual Events Series.